Bless you. Okay, so what we're trying today is hierarchical regression. So um, basically, multiple linear regression in steps. So a lot of this, we're just kind of under like, this is the same, click, 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 and get, until we get to the part that's a little different. Uh, so the example today is a silly one. The example next time is about baseball. So I'm excited. Um, after we control for demographic variables, so we have uh, gender and age, does an extra version of a participant predict how well they take care of their car? So we have our dependent variable of how well they take care of their car that we made up a scale for. We have gender, so we have a dummy coded variable, uh, and an age, and an extra version. So we're going to do this in two steps, where we have uh, model one, or step one, is going to be controlling for demographics, okay. sex or gender, whatever you want to use. Model two is where we're going to add extra version. So the big thing here is once we hit this point is um, model the second step or third step or fourth is always includes the previous step. So we're going to have model one plus this new variable. So we're going to add a different type of research question today. Um, and you'll, so there's a, just a couple little new things. So the first thing is power, of course. That's where we always start. Fucking time. Okay. And that is only <coughs> changed in the sense that we're picking a different statistical test. So under test family, I pick F. And then I pick fixed model R squared increase. For well, regular regression, we pick deviation from zero. Since we're doing a hierarchical regression, we're doing uh, increase in R squared. Because the question is, after controlling for this, do we add extra by adding in this next variable? So that is R squared increase. How much R squared are we getting for these extra variables? So this is testing if the last step is important. So you'd click determine and then direct. And it actually says partial R squared. So what did I do? I think I did a medium. Yeah, so let's do a medium of XI, so 0 0.09. Calculate and transfer. Uh, alpha is 0 0.05, power is 0 0.8. Then the next part is the slightly tricky one. So the t number of tested predictors is the number of variables in that step. So we're having one extra variable in this step. Okay, so I'm interested in R squared increase. There's one variable here, so we're going to use one. Okay. Number of total predictors is how many variables total are there. So that's one, two, three. So three total variables. It will freak out if you do them in the reverse order because total has to be more than the number of tested ones. <coughs> Calculate, and it should say 82, which is what I got down here. So the big thing to note on hierarchical is this R squared increase, that's the difference. And then this tested predictors is how many are in the last step that aren't in the previous steps. So how many extra did you add? And then the total is how many total are there. So there are three. So we need 82 people. I think we have like 100 and something. Fingers crossed. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So a lot of this is going to be the same. We're just going to walk through it um, to get more practice. So I'm going to check the accuracy of my data set. And it looks good. Clearly age can't be negative. Or four, I guess. Uh, extra version in car, I forget. I made up this data, so they're on their own scales. But gender is not factored yet. So we should factor gender. So I'll use the factor command to just give them labels. So that way it's clear that it's going to be a dummy coded variable. But as sort of a reiteration of dummy coding, there's two levels, male and female, so we're only going to get one column for it. Because okay, remember, it's levels minus one. Now, we did this last time where we had to stop. We don't have any missing data, so moving on. And we had to run the model so that we could do outliers and assumptions. 
But when we're using a hierarchical model, you have actually two models. So we're going to have one where there's only two variables and one where there's three. But in data screening, you always run the last step. So here we want to run the step with all of them. So remember, this is going to be age plus sex plus extra virgin. So we're running the last one. So include everybody here. And that's why it says final and has the exclamation points. It's just a reminder. <laughs> Only thing I'm doing with that output is using it to check for outliers. So even though we're doing this in steps, I want to know if people are outliers in the end. So how much influence are they having at the end? And let me exclude people who are influencing the last step, because that's the one I'm most interested in. All right, Mahalanobis has not changed. This is the same old Mahalanobis. I've dropped my gender column. Okay. So my cutoff is 1626 because I have <coughs> three degrees of freedom for age, extroversion, and my DD car. Okay. We're going to save if they're bad, and we should have no Mahalanobis outliers. So here for leverage, I put in the number of IVs in the final step. There are three. One, two, three. And we get to use gender. Um, so the three in Mahalanobis is because it's age, extra origin, and car, because you get to screen your DB. The three in this one is the three IVs here. Okay, so don't confuse the two things. So I put in K is three. Get my hat values, make my cutoff score. Cutoff score is 0.2, and I have 1, I think. So remember, the top row is uh, good and bad, and the bottom row is how many. So we've got one leverage outlier. Okay. Cooks hasn't changed either. See, our cutoff score is 0.11. Okay, they're almost never the same because they're different formulas. And we have two bad outliers. I was doing the example for next class, and it has like two and one, and it's like one and two coming back and forth. It's not on purpose. It's sometimes you'll get 30. It'll happen. But we want to do best two out of the three, so we're going to add them up. And we have one bad person. 38 people with no problems, one person with one problem, uh, one person with two problems. So remember the top row is how many issues they have, the bottom row is how many of those people. Because it's very tempting to think there are zero 38s. Now listen, ditch them. Deuces. So we eliminated one person for having at least two issues. And so when you're doing a write-up with this, you'll say one person had two out of the three leverage coats Mahalans. I re-ran my regression, the same one as up here, but now I've changed data sets because I eliminated somebody. So I don't want them to be in my normality pictures because they're an outlier, so we're cutting them out. We did that same thing last time, it's just it didn't matter. This time it does, because we eliminated somebody. Blah, blah, blah. <coughs> now, additivity, uh, remember we've got to drop gender, because it doesn't like categorical variables. So let's look at our correlation table. And just the biggest thing to remember is that car is our DB. We want it to be correlated with car. That's the point of this analysis, so ignore that. But age and extroversion are actually very positively correlated because I'm bad at making up fake data. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's not in the scary range. Remember, for above 0.7, you might start to have suppression. Uh, 0.9, you really got to do something else. It's 0.4, so about half of their data overlaps. Okay. So what that means, means if I kind of draw a picture, okay. if I had age and extroversion, 
25% of their data overlapped, which is about 20 something percent. Uh, so if that also overlaps with our DB, remember all this doesn't count when we talk about individual predictors. So the overlap, that just counts against us when we're talking about the individual predictor, uh, like PR squared. It does count towards R squared, but not the individual one. Um, you can also do the symbols table. It gave me one comma, or commas now are kind of what we're looking for, but that comma is between the DV and the IV. So that's actually good. You know, I think it's probably easier to look at the actual correlation table because they're not huge. And just to be sure you're ignoring the DV. So just the two IVs at this point. And that is what the big blue line is about on here. So don't tell me that the DV and the IV are too correlated. All this stays the same. So let's just look at the pictures. We've seen hundreds of these pictures now. Woo! -hoo. This one, wonky. So it's not so good that there's this big dip here at zero. I mean, it's between two and two, which is great, but it really shouldn't be by a little like that. It's, this is a slight normality problem. Um, at this point, when we start running regression, unless you've done something wrong, we will all get the same picture because there's no random component to it. Okay, so we should all get the same picture. Um, so that's not great. I have 30 people, though, so meh. Shrug. The data is going to be perfectly linear because that's how I made it up. On the homework assignments, I do have some real data that I tweaked, so it'll be a little less perfect. And homogeneity and homoscedasticity. It's okay. So it's between two and two. This is probably two out here. Two and two. And then the spread is nice and even. So I'm spoiling you with examples that look nice. All right. So all that, like, really not a whole lot different. Now let's get into the part that's different. So we have to run this in steps. So we're going to run model one with just age and gender, and then we'll do a completely separate model with extra version also. So I'm going to find the eraser. I'm going to find the smear. I'm going to make this a little bigger. So let's start with model one and see if it's overall significant, and then if the two individual variables are significant. So if you're looking at the R script here, you'll see that there's no more extra version. So I have just the ones I'm interested in in the first step. So I called this model one. To be clear, it's not the output that I'm using for screen. It's a separate thing. Model one, because it's the first one. So I have car is predicted by sex and age, my no out data set, because I don't want to include my outliers. And then let's look at a summary. I'm going to use this one. It's a little bigger. So is the overall model significant? Yeah. So this line here, 2 and 36. I think it's 2166. That's a comma. P less than 0.001. R squared is here. 0.55. Holy cow. The big effect. But power, we didn't do on this. Power is, is the addition to this important. So we haven't even gotten to what we're trying to do power for. All right, so that's significant. Is age significant? Yes. It's 0.54. So as age goes up, we take better care of our things. Oh, no, sorry. 
Oh, T. I'm losing my mind. Sorry. Let me try it. T, right? Take this 36. Stick it here. 2.92. Now we can do P less than 0 0.01 if you want, or P equals 0 0.006. I don't remember which one I did. I did it wrong. That's why. Oh, I rounded up. Okay. No, that's just wrong. Let's try again. There we go. Sense. So what about gender? Is gender significant? Yes. But look how big the uh, thing is. 25.56. So what does that mean? The difference between men and women is 25 points. And I could calculate the means to figure out which way that went. Uh, I'm pretty sure that means that the males treat the cars better. I think it's how I did it. Um, <coughs> So if you aren't sure, just calculate the means with T applied to see which group is higher. But they're both significant control variables. So yes, model one is significant. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, I put the interpretation. Males have higher scores. As age increases, we increase our taking care of our carness. But I really can't tell which one's better. Right? They're on very different scales because gender is a binary and age is continuous. So we're going to calculate beta to figure out which one's better. <coughs> so I got quant psi and then lm dot beta. So for gender it's 0 0.67 and for age it's 0.33. Okay. So gender is much better for predictor. <laughs> um, now that they're on the same scale, gender still looks better. All right, so remember those are uh, correlation. They're not correlations. They're z-scores, so they can go over one. In this case, they didn't, but they can. The other thing we'd want to do is partials. The only problem with the partials package is that it won't do categorical variables. Right? And so um, I just dropped the categorical variables when I calculated this. But in reality, what you should probably do is defactor the variable and calculate it with a defactor. Okay? But that is way more complicated than I ever wanted to get into. So we're just going to run partials. Knowing that we won't have it for so car is 0.9, not car, sorry, age, PR squared is 0.09. Okay. So clearly there's kind of a lot going on. Because R squared is 0.55, and this one's only 9%. But remember, they don't totally add up. So it's not like gender is the other 46% that different denominators. But we're clearly taking up a lot of the variance, but age is only 9% individually. All right, up to this point, this is all the one that we did last week. Now we're gonna second step it. Now I've got model two. Yes, age and gender are still in here, but don't care. What I'm really interested in is the addition of extroversion. People differ on this point, but the way I've always learned it is that you only look at the variable at the step it went in. So it went into the equation in model one, I looked at it in model one, and now it's going to be part of model two because I want to control for it, but whatever, don't care about it. People differ on this point, but why do the work twice? So it can be a lazy statistician, maybe. Um, so I only want to look at extroversion. I don't want to interpret them. They're going to change. These values will be different, 
because I have another variable in the equation and they're going to be based on having that variable. But I just want to see if the addition of this one is significant. And so it says that somewhere, probably right here. Um, now we add the rest of them. Here, so this is page 12. Oh, that's about the overall model being significant. I haven't gotten there yet. I don't know. Somewhere in here it says only look at them in the step that they're in. If they went into model one, that's the only time I'm going to talk about them. <coughs> All right. So my second step here I called model two. You have to have them saved as separate things. Do not call both of them model one. We're going to use both of them in a second. Model two's got all three variables. So the thing that people do wrong here is they just include extra versions. R doesn't know that you still want to keep those other two in there. Right? So it's including all three. I've got these two, now add this one. So you add on to it. And then let's look at that one. So is the overall model significant? Yes. Because look at my new R squared, it's 0.61. Do I care? No. That's why it says, uh, who cares? I mean, yeah, you do. But um, essentially what I want to know is, did adding the extra variable help? So I don't, if this model is significant, right, 0.55, I want to know if just adding this is significant, not if the whole thing is still significant. Can you see the distinction just a little bit? So this question here, is the model significant, tests if r squared is greater than zero. Well, yeah, it's 0.61, of course it is. So if you have a big model one and model two is small, this will still be significant. It was kind of cheating. So really the question, I don't want to ask this. I want to ask if the change in r squared is greater than zero. So I don't want to know if the overall r squared is bigger than zero. That tests all three variables at once. I don't know if the change is bigger than zero. <coughs> Bless you. Okay. So we're trying to see, is model two important? Should we have even done that? Okay. And then if you did a model three, it would be, is the change from two to three significant? Okay. So it's kind of a step. And that function, believe it or not, is ANOVA. Lowercase a, if you do uppercase a, you're going to do something totally different. Um, so it's odd to me that ANOVAs are run using not the word ANOVA, but comparing regression models are ANOVAs. So let's run this line. It's ANOVA model 1, model 2. Oh, look at that output. Okay, so we're here. So nicely, it writes it out for you. Yeah, it's x plus h, x plus h plus x version. So clearly this is the piece that we're testing, is what's left in model 2. Um, I do think we have to do them in order. Models first. I haven't tried it the other way. It gives you a bunch of stuff that doesn't make any sense, but we're going to look at this last line. DF1 is 1. So this DF is the first one. This is DF2. Why are they in the wrong order? I don't know. So 1 at 35. Uh, this is sum of squares, and we'll get f here, so 5.96. And is that significant? You get the little, the p <coughs> is the only one here. So <coughs> 0.02, yes. So this is technically a change in f, which is why I have the deltas here on page 13, 14, whatever we're on, 13. And what that code does is it tells me if adding this step was important. Which is what I, what I tested power for. So, yay. Um, what's my effect size? Well, it's a change in R squared. There's no magic to this one. You just subtract. So I had 0.55. I now have 0.61. A little bit of math. 06. So I just subtracted them. And that to me is much more interesting than telling that somebody that 0.61 r squared is greater than zero. 
duh. I want to know, is that extra step important? And sometimes you might be adding three or four variables. So are these three or four variables important? OK, now which variable is significant? At the moment, we just added one to kind of keep it simple. Um, but if you had you know, age plus gender plus extrovert, let's say you did the whole big five. So you had ex five extra variables here. Um, that would tell me that all five of those were important. And then I would narrow it down, which one of these five was the best. All right, now is the variable important? If you say the model's significant, the variable's gonna be significant. If there's only one, three, four. So here's T, 2.44, but watch. T now needs to be 35 over here. It's 36 here, because it's step one. It's 35 here, because it's step two. So it always needs to match. The other thing is, if you only have one variable, these two will match E. Because that's all you're testing is the one. OK, so how do I know which variable is the most important? Wait, oh, here's the other thing I wanted to look at what happened to age. Remember we talked about age and extroversion were really highly correlated? When you added extroversion, it age went away. So that's why I'm only talking about it here. At first, without thinking about extroversion, it is a significant predictor. As age goes up, car care goes up. But because these are two so highly correlated, it suppressed it out. And as you can say, no, extroversion is really what's going on. Age is just there. It's still positive, but you see how much it dropped. So that's why you only talk about them when they go in. The next thing we want to do is the same set of steps, beta. I don't need this again. Go away. So beta for extroversion is 0.33. So if I compare that to age, that's the reason that's what's going on. It's, they're the same strengths. And because they overlap, you'll see now that it knocked out a lot of age. Not so correlated with gender, though, because it didn't change gender too much. And then I would do part and partials. So I did two through four. That's going to be two, three, and four. I'm still dropping gender because I have to. And extroversion and car is 0.31. The addition of that step is 6% of the variance overall, but that is a big predictor with 31% of the unique variance. So these are telling you different things. This is 6% towards the total R squared. I remember that includes all of the overlap, everything. So it only adds 6%, but it's 31% of the unique variance of just that variable over the error. So it is a big predictor. <coughs> Even age wasn't that important earlier. It was only 9%. All right. Last but not least, kind of keep it short today. Yay! Um, is making that picture. So, I'll load my theme coding. We still have to make our fitted values because we, we have to graph all of the x's together. I mean, three. So be sure you use the last model number here. So if there are three steps, this would be model three. Three values. And then the plot, we're going to use the x-axis is fitted and the y-axis is the dv. So we've just taken um, age, gender, and extroversion and made it one variable. And then these are the same ones we've been doing. Look how cute. Clearly made of data. Look how close the dots are to the line. Okay. But remember, this is a 95% confidence interval band, so we want the dots to be closer. This is their predicted score here. So we would have predicted, given gender, age, and extroversion, they make this score. Here's what they actually make. So in a perfect world, they line up all in a straight little line. 
Um, now, when you see regressions published in journals, they don't always have this kind of picture because people normally just report a table of all the bees. But if you wanted to make a picture, this is probably the best way to represent it, multiple variables. If you have one X and one Y, do scatterplot. So that is MLR.